Hello, uh, welcome to the 35th class in our course, The Physics of Materials. Uh, in the last class, uh, we looked at uh, uh, how bands come about and how band gaps come about from the uh, um, approach taken by two different uh, uh, ways of approaching this problem. Uh, one was the free electron approximation and the other was the tight binding approximation. So, uh, we have actually looked at the free electron approximation in considerable detail. Uh, we briefly looked at the tight binding approximation and I uh, uh, told you the reasons why we focus more on the free electron approximation because that is more relevant for uh, metallic systems and such. Uh, but in principle both of them should give us uh, the same kinds of results, uh, they should predict the same, uh, make the same predictions and largely they do. Uh, it is just that uh, the tight binding approximation uh, is more suitable for uh, uh, insulators and uh, semiconductors uh, and such. So, uh, and the free electron uh, approximation is more suitable for metallic systems, um, more appropriate at least. Uh, in the context of both these approaches, we have seen uh, where bands arise from uh, and in particular uh, the uh, fact that Brillouin zones interact with the Fermi surface and uh, tell us the bands and band gaps uh, that exist in a, in a material in the free electron approximation and the importance of interatomic spacing uh, when it comes to tight binding approximation. In this context, in both approaches we see that uh, in principle they have the details in place uh, to tell us why anisotropy should exist in a material. Uh, certainly in the case of free, uh, free electron approximation, the geometry of this crystal structure uh, is reflected in the uh, geometry of the Brillouin zone and therefore, that is directly uh, uh, reflected in uh, the manner in which the Brillouin zone now interacts with the Fermi surface. Okay. So, uh, and therefore, the locations where there is an interaction, the extent to which an interaction exists, all of these are uh, directly related to the shape of the Brillouin zone uh, and uh, where it is with respect to the Fermi surface uh, and therefore, uh, the directionality arises uh, as a direct result of this uh, interaction. Uh, so, in this context we have seen the importance of the Fermi surface, uh, we also briefly saw that you know once you can, uh, once you understand that there are bands and band gaps, uh, you can actually even manipulate materials uh, and uh, increase or decrease the band gap and therefore, change their uh, properties. Uh, also in the context that we know that there are bands and band gaps, we have, uh, we briefly saw how uh, metallic systems differ from uh, semiconducting systems and differ from insulating systems with respect to those band gaps and bands. Uh, in this class, we will uh, spend more time on the semiconducting uh, systems, uh, semiconductors in general. Uh, we will see uh, where many of the concepts we have learnt uh, so far uh, um, are how they are relevant to the semiconductors, uh, for example, the Fermi surface. A and we will also see the importance of uh, the uh, E versus K diagram uh, and what it tells us about properties. Uh, more specifically, uh, we will see why the E versus K diagram uh, gives us much more useful detail of the system than a flat band diagram, which in fact in some sense captures the same, uh, it still tells us what is an allowed uh, energy level and what is a band gap. So, the E versus K relationship is important and we will see why it is important. And also in the context of uh, the semiconductors, we will also get an idea of uh, the optical properties uh, and how all of this information comes together uh, in, in uh, when we talk of optical properties of materials. Okay? So, this is what we will do. So, when we look at semiconductors, uh, in principle we have, uh, uh, they, are, they are classified as intrinsic semiconductors and uh, extrinsic semiconductors. Um, in, uh, in principle, the main difference really is that uh, in intrinsic semiconductors, the uh, property that you see is that of a, a, as pure a material as you can get uh, and uh, there are at least there are no uh, deliberate additives to this material, you are seeing the property of that material. Uh, and in uh, extrinsic semiconductors, we have uh, deliberately added some dopants, uh, which uh, change the manner in which the material be, uh, responds. But in, in a more fundamental sense, what we are saying is that intrinsic semiconductors are those where the uh, properties uh, we are measuring, at least in this case the uh, uh, say the uh, carrier concentration and such uh, is a direct uh, result of the uh, temperature of the material, it is the, uh, it is uh, primarily dependent on the temperature of the material, that is what uh, decides uh, the carrier concentration uh, in, in an intrinsic semiconductor. In an extrinsic semiconductor that, conductor, that is not necessarily so, in fact there are uh, regions in, uh, in uh, of temperature where the, uh, uh, the behavior of the uh, semiconductor is uh, dictated uh, 
uh, by uh, factors that are completely uh, unrelated to temperature. Uh, they depend entirely on the uh, uh, extent of doping that you have done to it, okay, or the extent of uh, uh, additional elements that you have added to it. So, in intrinsic semiconductors, so we will first look at intrinsic semiconductors, then we will talk about uh, extrinsic semiconductors. So, uh, of course, the uh, standard uh, classic examples are basically the intrinsic semiconductors can be elemental or compound based. So, these are elemental semiconductors that are intrinsic, they are group 4A uh, elements, uh, silicon and germanium and we could also have compound semiconductors that are still intrinsic and they would consist of elements which are on either side of this uh, uh, group 4A. So, we would we could take a, a 3A uh, element and mix it with a uh, 5A element and then you would get a compound semiconductor. You could also take a, a group 2B element and mix it with a 6A element and you would get a compound semiconductor. So, that is basically what you are looking at. So, we can have 3A and uh, 5A uh, elements. So, these are called 3 5 compounds. Right. So, these are called 3 5 compounds and uh, uh, so uh, an example would be uh, 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 we could have gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide, uh, we could also have uh, indium antimonide. These are uh, compound semiconductors, uh, but they are intrinsic in nature. So, uh, they behave as though uh, their behavior response is uh, really based on temperature. Uh, you could also have uh, 2 6 compounds, so 2 B and uh, 6 A compounds. So, an example of that would be uh, say cadmium sulphide. Okay. So, this would then be called a 2 6 compound for obvious reasons. Okay, so, this is a 2 6 compound. Um, you can go further and further in, uh, in the periodic table on either side of group 4A, but the problem then arises is as you go further and further away, uh, the electron uh, the electronegativities and electron affinities of theirs begins to uh, uh, change so much that you are favoring more an ionic bond rather than a covalent bond. And these are elements that uh, this kind of a behavior you see mostly uh, with uh, in situations where you have a a covalent bond rather than an ionic bond. In an ionic bond, the uh, electron simply gets localized. So, it is not in a position to be shared or moved, moved around, whereas here they move around. So, this is uh, it gets trapped and so this is not what we are looking at. We are looking at covalently bonded uh, elements. So the, so, the further away you go, it becomes more and more ionic. So, that is the uh, issue that you face. Okay. So, so this is a compound, these are compound semiconductors uh, 3, 5 and uh, 2, uh, 4. Uh, we could look at uh, these elements depending on uh, uh, where you encounter them. You will either uh, hear the description in terms of bonds and how the electrons are shared between bonds uh, or alternately we uh, look in terms of the uh, uh, band structure. Okay. So, in our, uh, in our uh, discussion we prefer to use the band structure. Ultimately, we are talking of the same thing. So, uh, therefore, uh, only whatever is convenient to us is all that we use. Okay. So, we are going to talk in terms of band structure. So, this is what we have. Uh, if you are talking of uh, extrinsic semiconductors, then we could take uh, uh, silicon okay, and so we can uh, dope it with say gallium. Okay, um, or if you say you dope it with arsenic for example then you will have uh, additional electrons. Uh, so, this would so any uh, 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 basically a group this is group 4 A. So, if you uh, dope it with uh, any element that is uh, 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 from the group 5 A, then basically you have an n type uh, semiconductor, because you have additional electrons from the uh, arsenic which can uh, roam around. Uh, or you could dope it with uh, uh, so for again again silicon with say gallium which is 3 a uh, then you would have a p type semiconductor which means you are short on electrons uh, and so that uh, and that is why it is called p type um, in principle uh, ultimately there are some charge carriers in these uh, materials and uh, 
the two charge carriers that we define are uh, that we are uh, that the first one we are very familiar with it is the electron. So, electrons are charge carriers and so that is our discussion when we talk of intrinsic semiconductors and so on this is what we are starting out with. But every time an electron uh, if you have an electron that is, is sort of uh, conspicuous by, by its absence so to speak. So, then uh, if an electron is absent from a location then uh, we treat it as though uh, a, a, an entity with opposite charge exists at that location ok. So, that and that would be a hole. So, it has the opposite charge of an electron. So, that is what we have we have electrons and holes. So, in terms of uh, uh, when you talk of bands So, when you talk of uh, uh, a filled uh, uh, valence band and an empty conduction band, uh, every time you take an electron from here and move it across here ok. So, now you have an electron here, you have left behind a vacant location here ok, you are leaving, you are leaving behind a vacant location here sort of. So, that is treated as a hole. So, for every electron that is going into the conduction band, it leaves behind a hole in the valence band ok. So, that is uh, how we uh, look at this system alright. So, so, we have electrons and holes which could uh, participate in the conduction process both of them contribute in some ways to the conduction process uh, and uh, so therefore, they are important charge carriers. If you have a system where you have uh, dominantly a, a large number of electrons uh, relative to holes that would be an n type semiconductor and another case where you have uh, a significant amount of holes uh, relative to the number of uh, electrons uh, that, that, that can move around then that would be a p type semiconductor and those are accomplished by doing appropriate doping to a material in uh, group 4 a. Okay, so, this is what uh, we are uh, looking at fine. So, uh, so this is what uh, we are uh, looking at in terms of uh, the uh, uh, possibilities of uh, an electron being present at some location and a, a hole being present at uh, some other location. So, now in terms of conductivity. Right, we originally wrote uh, the uh, flux of current or the current density. Uh, so, J is uh, simply uh, E times uh, the conductivity sigma E right. So, uh, this uh, uh, flux of uh, current is also the, uh, the number density of the charge carriers times the charge that is being carried times the velocity with which they are moving. So, let us say that is the drift velocity. So, N E V D. So, this is also equal to N E V D. or rearranging this if you just take this second part of the equation here this this equation here. So, sigma equals n e v d by the uh, field. So, this is the field this is the conductivity this is the number density of the charge carriers this is the uh, charge on the charge carrier and this is the drift velocity of the charge carrier. So, if you look at this this term here is the mobility mobility of the charge carrier we define this as the mobility it is the velocity attained by the charge carrier per unit driving force driving field that uh, that exists there. So, therefore, this is simply n e and mu e is the symbol used for the mobility of the uh, charge carrier. So, that is what we have here ok. So, this is what we have as I mentioned in uh, in an intrinsic semiconductor for every electron if you look at intrinsic semiconductors. for every electron uh, in the uh, conduction band there is a hole in the valence band ok. So, there is a hole in the valence band for every electron in the conduction band because there is a where as it moves away it leaves behind a hole. Now, when you apply a field the electrons in the conduction band can move and effectively the holes in the valence band can also move except they will move in the opposite direction. In, in principle you can actually step back and say in fact, it is only the electrons that are moving, but as the electrons fill up that hole location it you can think of the hole moving in the opposite direction ok. So, in principle the uh, charge uh, it is it is easier to describe it in terms of electrons and holes. So, we talk in terms of electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band ok. So, uh, both of them can participate in the conduction. So, in fact, for a semiconductor the conductivity that we get is n times e 
times mu e plus if n is the uh, number of uh, electrons per unit volume we can designate the number of holes per unit volume using p p times the charge again its charge is simply the charge of the electron it is just an opposite charge times the mobility of the hole okay mobility of the hole so we have uh, n e mu e plus p e mu h that is the conductivity of a uh, semiconductor okay so uh, at a given temperature so that is what uh, we are looking at now uh, in an intrinsic semiconductor for every electron in the uh, conduction band there is a hole in the valence band therefore n is equal to p the uh, whatever is the number density of uh, free electrons the charge carriers the, uh, uh, I, we won't call it free electrons the number density of electrons uh, per unit volume in the uh, conduction band the uh, uh, number of electron uh, holes per unit volume in the valence band is going to be the same p right so n is equal to p and that is called the intrinsic charge carrier concentration or intrinsic carrier concentration okay so uh, n is equal to p is equal to ni or the intrinsic carrier concentration n okay so that is for an intrinsic semiconductor so therefore uh, sigma is simply ni times e times n uh, sorry mu e plus mu h okay so uh, ni times e time, uh, times mu e plus mu h this mu e and mu h are not actually the same uh, even though you are saying you know a, i mean electron moving in the uh, in this case we are talking of electrons moving in the conduction band and that case we are talking of uh, holes moving in the valence band okay uh, uh, so uh, th uh, but the mobility of the electron is different from the mobility of the hole in general uh, electron mobility in these situations is higher than that of the mo hole mobility and uh, in a sense we can uh, rationalize it by thinking that you know if you are going to have electrons moving in, in relatively in, in a situation where most of the states are empty which is the case of the electrons which are now running across in the conduction band they are more likely to move around more freely right so it is a direct reflection of the environment in which they are moving whereas the uh, electrons which are sitting in the uh, uh, valence band where they are largely filled except for the few electrons that have few electron states which have become vacant in other words for the few holes that are there those electrons are actually moving with uh, much more sluggishly because uh, they have to they are faced in a they, they are sort of moving in a crowded area so therefore the holes the, which is effectively the other way in which we are looking at the electron movement in the uh, uh, valence band their mobility is less that is the way that is one way in which we could rationalize the situation but anyway the point is that the uh, electron mobility and the hole mobility are not necessarily the same and therefore we write ni the intrinsic charge carrier concentration uh, times the charge times the mobilities of those two uh, species okay so this is what we have now uh, in this context i also want to point out that uh, when we wrote the intrinsic semiconductors Uh, in terms of what we have already discussed, I pointed this out uh, towards the end of last class. For uh, so this is the uh, uh, valence band, and that is the conduction band. Uh, in terms of what we have discussed. Uh, the important parameter that we have uh, of relevance is the Fermi energy and so for an intrinsic semiconductor uh, the, the Fermi energy is in fact defined as being the midpoint of this uh, band gap. So this is where you have the E f okay. So this is how you write it for a uh, intrinsic semiconductor. Now the situation is slightly different for an extrinsic semiconductor, extrinsic semiconductor okay we in, we could have an n type or a p type so let's start with an n type in an n type uh, we have again a, uh, a conduction band and a valence band and say for example we have introduced a group 5a element uh, into this group 4 uh, uh, element so what will happen is uh, you have additional electrons those electron levels are actually very close to the uh, conduction band 
okay. So, uh, they can very easily get into the conduction band. In fact, that is the reason why they dominate the behavior of an n type uh, semiconductor, all right. So, uh, so this is the impurity level. Okay. Uh, and uh, therefore, for a, uh, uh, in terms of the highest energy level now being occupied by the uh, electrons and so on, this is what defines it much more than what is sitting here. So, therefore, for an uh, uh, extrinsic semiconductor, n type extrinsic semiconductor, this is now the Fermi energy. Fermi energy moves to a value very close to the uh, uh, conduction band, the bottom of the conduction band. Okay, so, that is what happens for an extrinsic semiconductor of n type. If you go to p type, so let us just do p type here, an analogous situation, but, but with opposite uh, uh, effect is what we are going to see. So, p type would look something like this, we have uh, the uh, conduction band, we have a valence band, this is full. Now, the impurity you are introducing is a, a group 3 a type of element, let us say that that is what we have done and therefore, that has less electrons uh, than the uh, than what the group uh, 4 a is uh, uh, in a position to provide. So, in terms of bonds and such it has uh, one less electron. In terms of a band structure it means that in, a, in terms of energy levels it has an acceptor level which I will indicate as circles here. it has an acceptor level very close to the top of the uh, valence band of the parent material. Okay. Uh, so, what happens is the moment you raise temperature, uh, the electrons do not have to go all the way up to the conduction band to conduct, they simply have to get into this uh, uh, acceptor levels here and they can start conducting. Okay. Uh, and therefore, the uh, uh, so this now defines the uh, position of where the highest energy electrons are so to speak or uh, in or in, in, in that sense if you want to describe it. And so, this, uh, this now defines the Fermi energy for a p type semiconductor. So, the Fermi energy of a p type semiconductor is uh, virtually at the uh, uh, acceptor levels of a p type semiconductor, which is very close to the top of the valence band of the p type semiconductor. Uh, the Fermi energy for a uh, n type semiconductor is uh, effectively uh, at the uh, donor level. So, this is the impurity level donor level. and this is the acceptor level. So, uh, for a uh, n type semiconductor the Fermi energy is at the acceptor level or uh, virtually at the acceptor level, uh, I am sorry virtually at the donor level of the n type semiconductor. Okay. So, uh, Fermi energy is virtually at the donor level uh, for the uh, n type semiconductor. So, uh, so, this is important to understand this picture. Uh, because uh, when you look at uh, uh, what is happening when you make uh, when you make you know uh, semiconductor devices when you take an n type semiconductor and put it in uh, contact direct physical contact with the p type semiconductor uh, i mentioned that you know the fermi energy is like the chemical potential of the electrons so uh, if if the chemical potential of the electrons is high on one side and low on the other side they will flow it will flow till the chemical potentials become equal okay so that is how when you put uh, uh, different types of uh, semiconductors together electrons move between them to ensure that the uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi levels uh, attempt to equalize. Okay. So, that is how uh, this uh, process occurs. Okay. So, now uh, we have uh, spoken often about the conductivity of uh, the uh, materials and we have seen now that for, uh, for most materials I mean uh, we are looking at the charge carrier concentration is a very important uh, factor that contributes to the uh, conduction process. Right. So, uh, it is of interest to see uh, how the, uh, the charge carrier concentration varies for an intrinsic semiconductor versus an extrinsic semiconductor as a function of uh, uh, let us say the temperatures at which you are subjecting the material to. So, what you will actually see is something like this. Um, so, this is in a linear scale. So, let us say this is about 200 Kelvin, this is 0, this is uh, um, so, this is 0, this is 100, this is 200, this is 300, this is 400, this is 500 Kelvin and this is uh, uh, this is also 0, this is uh, um, put it here 10 power 21 uh, per meter cube, 2 into 10 power 21 per meter cube, 
uh, charge carrier concentration and so on. What happens is, uh, if you look at the extrinsic semiconductor at very low temperatures, we will ju just draw the behavior and I will explain it to you. You see a behavior with respect to temperature that looks like this, okay, of charge carrier concentration uh, for an extrinsic semiconductor. For an intrinsic semiconductor, you see a behavior that looks like this. Okay, so, intrinsic uh, semiconductor you see a behavior that looks like this. The point is this uh, for an extrinsic semiconductor what happens is as you initially there is a region at very low temperatures which is called a freeze out zone where the energy is simply too low for any electronic transitions to occur and so therefore the electrons remain frozen. They do not get into the uh, um, conduction band nor do they get into the acceptor levels nothing happens everything looks frozen. Then at some once you cross a certain threshold that is enough energy for the uh, extrinsic uh, the dopant uh, levels to participate in the process because they require only a very small amount of energy to either uh, you know take electrons from the conduction band into the acceptor levels which are very close to the conduction band or to take electrons from the donor levels and put them into the uh, conduction band which is very close to the uh, because it is very close to the conduction band. So, you need only a tiny amount of energy to do that as opposed to taking an electron from the conduction band uh, from the valence band all the way to the conduction band right. If you wish you can look here, you will require a very small amount of energy to move this electron up here or to move an electron into this acceptor level. Relatively speaking you need a larger amount of energy to move an electron from here all the way up to here. So, that is the difference. Okay. So, this is a larger amount of energy, this is energy in the axis. So, this is a larger amount of energy, this is a small amount of energy, this is a small amount of energy. So, at very small temperatures you have enough energy to do this uh, or to do this and so uh, and you essentially saturate the process everything that can go goes off as soon as you cross some temperature threshold almost everything that can go here uh, goes off there immediately and that is a finite amount of uh, levels here as acceptor levels or uh, donor levels because that depends on what doping you have done to the system what percentage doping you have done to the system right so that is finite so uh, immediately the conduction process starts you have a fair number of charge carriers but that stays constant that stays constant for a long period of time uh, because that is a finite uh, process uh, relatively speaking uh, because there is very not just finite it is a very small number of uh, uh, dopants that uh, small amount of dopant that you have put. Here on the other hand you will take a lot of energy before you start moving electrons across but once you do once you cross a certain threshold you can keep on as you raise the temperature you can keep on increasing the number of electrons uh, that get into the uh, uh, conduction band. Okay. So, you can keep increasing the uh, charge carrier concentration by raising the temperature. So, uh, that is what you see here. Uh, in the for the extrinsic semiconductor initially everything is frozen not there is not enough energy to move the uh, uh, electrons across even the small distance that they have to move in energy small amount of energy. Once you cross a certain threshold all the uh, acceptor levels participate or all the donor levels participate. So, you saturate out uh, so this now becomes a representative of the uh, dopant concentration because the dopant concentration will, uh, will impact the charge carrier concentration directly and so this becomes based on your dopant concentration this can move up or down but it stays constant as you raise the temperature you have already saturated it out there is nothing more to put into the dopant level uh, or from the dopant level. So, it stays constant as you go to very high temperatures relatively speaking then intrinsic uh, transitions also begin to occur. Okay. Even in an extrinsic uh, uh, semiconductor nothing prevents a transition from the uh, uh, valence band to the conduction band you simply have to have enough energy to uh, enable the transition. So, if you get to high enough temperature the transition will occur. So, therefore, you can start seeing the charge carrier concentration once again increase and that will of course, if you look at an intrinsic semiconductor there is nothing happening till you come to that temperature high enough temperature. So, that you provide enough energy for that transition from the uh, valence band to the conduction band from then on as you raise the temperature this keeps going up. Okay. So, because you are putting more and more uh, uh, electrons into the uh, uh, um, conduction band. So, in terms of an extrinsic semiconductor this is the this is called the freeze out zone up to up to this temperature it behaves like an extrinsic semiconductor um, extrinsic uh, uh, zone or extrinsic uh, conduction or extrinsic uh, behavior. Okay, so, extrinsic behavior you have here 
and then once you cross this uh, temperature range here, you start seeing intrinsic behavior. Right. So, you can get extrinsic behavior here and then intrinsic behavior here. So, uh, as you raise the temperature, eventually it starts behaving like an intrinsic semiconductor. The material begins to behave like an intrinsic. So, this is what you see. Um, the other parameter we wish to know, so this is how the charge carrier concentration. So, when we look at uh, the fact that conductivity is a function of the charge uh, carrier concentration, the charge of the electron and the mobility of that uh, carrier. Right. So, you have um, conductivity sigma is uh, n charge carrier concentration, charge of that uh, charge carrier times the mobility of that charge carrier mu e or mu h or whatever you want to do. So, these are three parameters. We have already seen how n can vary for an intrinsic semiconductor or an extrinsic semiconductor. E is fixed. It is of interest to see how the mobility of the electron will change. So, mobility of the electron if you wish to see what we will see uh, mobility of electron or mobility of hole. Uh, we can uh, look at it uh, uh, as a function of uh, temperature uh, or as a function of uh, impurity concentration. So, if you uh, see in general what you will see is uh, let us say this is uh, um, in a log scale this is minus 3, minus 2, uh, minus 1 log of mu okay. and uh, this is uh, the impurity concentration 10 power 15. Uh, 10 power 16, 10 power 17, 10 power 18, we we'll just put something down 10 power 19, 10 power 20. So, this is the impurity concentration uh, per meter cube, okay. so per meter cube. So, uh, or this is particle atoms per meter cube if you want to call it. Um, what you will see is that in general you will see a trend that looks like this as you raise the uh, impurity concentration the uh, mobilities decrease. So, this is uh, something like this is mu e this is mu h I told you that mu h generally tends to be lower than mu e. So, the uh, mobility of the uh, uh, carrier carriers begins to decrease. So, in terms of our understanding so these are all the things that are occurring this is how the charge carrier uh, concentration is going up or changing with the uh, uh, temperature this is how the mobility is changing with impurity uh, uh, concentration and similarly even with respect to temperature if you uh, put up uh, mobility values as a function of temperature. So, again we will say you know same kind of temperature range 0, 100, uh, 200, 300, 400 and 500 these are in Kelvin, Kelvin okay. so this is Kelvin this is also Kelvin and if you look at uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, mobility values similarly we can write you know a minus 3, uh, minus 2, minus 1 uh, and 0. So, uh, uh, that is what uh, we can look at. So, if you see uh, what you will see is uh, for uh, we have to now define this is as a function of temperature mobility as a function of temperature which we can define at a specific impurity concentration values. So, for a given impurity concentration value, so uh, the general trend will look like this uh, we are only drawing schematics here you are looking at some behavior that looks like that uh, with temperature it is going down or something like that is the and this is impurity concentration okay, increasing. Uh, so, uh, whatever if you want to look at these values here let me just say this is 10 power 20 per meter cube and so on 10 power 19. Uh, or this is at higher concentration. So, this is 10 power 20, 10 power 22, 10 power 25 per meter cube. So, as you uh, so basically as you increase the impurity concentration the mobility is coming down as you raise the temperature mobility is coming down. Okay. So, uh, so these are all the parameters that affect the conductivity okay, uh, in terms of this equation here. And uh, this is just I will remove this mu so that there is no confusion it is just a, a mobility of whatever is your charge carrier right. So, but ultimately conductivity goes up okay. So, we, uh, we, uh, we have to understand this fundamental idea that you know when I mentioned this that when we looked at metals uh, if you look at uh, the conductivity of a metal it has a positive coefficient uh, of for the uh, thermal coefficient for resistivity. So, as you raise the temperature of the metal the resistance of the metal goes up or conductivity of the metal comes down. This is not true for semiconductors, it is not true for ionic conductors and so on. 
and uh, the fact that it is not true for semiconductors should become consistent with this picture that we have here. What we see is as you raise the temperature uh, actually the mobilities of the uh, of the species decreases, but what is uh, so therefore this term is uh, going down mobility of the uh, uh, conducting uh, species is going down and in that sense it is the same as that of uh, 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 the, the situation is the same as that uh, experienced in the metallic system. In the metallic system also the conductivity comes down as you raise temperature because the mobility of the species the electrons begins to come down because it is now having more collisions with uh, whatever are the uh, other scattering uh, it is having encountering more scattering events right. So, th therefore, in terms of mobility the general trend is not uh, is basically the same whether you are talking of a semiconducting material or you are talking of a uh, metallic conducting material in, in general as you raise the temperature mobility is going to come down in general. But what changes the pictures dramatically is this value of n ok. Uh, in a uh, in a metallic conductor we simply talk of the number of free electrons per unit volume that number of free electrons per unit volume is a fixed number we are not it, or largely it is a fixed number it is not something that we have uh, manipulating in a significant way it is a large number but it is a large but largely uh, constant number we are not really manipulating it in a sim, say in any significant manner therefore this sort of remains constant the charge on the charge carrier remains a constant mobility keeps coming down in a metallic conductor therefore uh, the conductivity of the material comes down as a function of temperature for a metallic conductor. For a semiconducting material uh, again mobility is coming down as a function of temperature this E is a constant, but this N actually inc increases with temperature right you have seen here as you go up in temperature the number of charge carriers per unit volume is actually going up ok. So, this is uh, uh, per unit volume uh, per meter cube ok. So, charge carriers per meter cube. So, uh, uh, the number of charge carriers per meter cube is going up it goes up abruptly in the case of an extrinsic semiconductor it goes up gradually if it is an intrinsic sem semiconductor, but it goes up. So, therefore, this n is always going up at temperature what we generally see is that for the semiconducting systems the manner in which the uh, uh, n goes up more than compensates for the manner in which the mu comes down the rate at which n goes up more than compensates for the rate at which mu comes down ok. As a result we see an increase in conductivity. So, from all that we have now understood we now see that there is a fundamental difference between what a metal is and a semiconductor is in terms of its conduction process uh, and we are able to see it because we are able to find out the parameters that affect the conductivity process. We see that the charge carrier concentration uh, is the way in which the charge carrier concentration is uh, uh, varying as a function of temperature is significantly different for a, a semiconductor than it is for a metal and that is the reason why the conductivity behavior is so different. Uh, in terms of the mu actually the, uh, the behavior is more or less the same ok. I will also point out that for a metallic system the n is actually a very large number for a semiconductor relatively speaking the n is actually a small number compared to a metallic system. That is the reason why overall the conductivity of a semiconductor is less than the conductivity of a metallic system ok. So, the electronic conductivity of a semiconductor overall average is going to be less than the average metallic uh, average conductivity of typical metallic systems ok. So, the sigma value of a semiconductor is going to be less than a sigma value of a uh, metal, but the behavior of the sigma is going to be different uh, for a metal as you it will start at a high value, but it will keep coming down as you raise temperature for a semiconductor it will start at a low value, but as you ra uh, raise the temperature it will go up ok. So, that is the difference between the two and this is how we understand it from fundamental principles in terms of how the constituents of the material are behaving in this case the electrons are behaving what is happening in terms of transitions and, and uh, how uh, they are contributing to this uh, of uh, the um, experimental param parameter the conductivity which is what we measure all right. So, we have now had a reasonably good overview of, of the semiconductor system um, and we have seen how important uh, characteristics of the semiconducting system uh, correlate with a lot of things that we have learned ok. Uh, what we will do uh, is also look at uh, the optical properties uh, displayed by uh, different materials uh, in the context of all the uh, band gaps and so on and then see if uh, what we have learnt uh, helps us get better insight into the optical properties of uh, materials which we will do right now. So, now uh, when you talk of optical properties we are talking first of all of uh, uh, often we are talking of uh, uh, light in the vis uh, visible spectrum. So, we are looking at uh, 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 wavelengths in the uh, visible spectrum ok. So, uh, what happens is uh, the energy of those wavelengths is E equals h nu is equal to E h c by lambda ok. Now, if the incoming radiation has enough 
energy if this h nu is large enough that when it encounters a material with a band gap e g okay so this is e g if e g okay if h nu is greater than or equal to e g okay so h is a constant planck's constant so it rather therefore if you keep raising the frequency uh, at some frequency you will uh, have enough energy in the incoming radiation that it is greater than the band gap of the material that is uh, uh, um, that is on on which the uh, the radiation is incident then it will enable a transition from here to here okay and uh, so at that point the material begins to absorb this radiation okay so that is what is happening now uh, the Im important thing is so so any frequency higher than this any uh, energy higher than this this material will absorb any uh, frequency less than this will actually get transmitted through the material the material will not be able to interact with that radiation so if you make a defect free material uh, physically defect free material it will uh, of this kind of with this kind of a band gap uh, what you will generally see is if you put low enough uh, frequencies the uh, uh, it will be transparent to those low frequencies only when you cross some a certain frequency it will start absorbing that frequency by the same token this is the reason why metallic systems are opaque because in metallic systems there is virtually no gap you have you have uh, either a half filled energy level so therefore there is there is virtually no uh, even for tiny amounts of energy there are available states immediately above what is filled so therefore uh, a metal can keep absorbing energy uh, over a very wide range of frequencies and that is why uh, essentially when you look at a metal it looks opaque if light falls on it it gets absorbed so that is why it looks opaque, opaque. whereas uh, this looks uh, depending on what semiconducting material you have and what band gap it has it can be transparent okay so that is how uh, we see this uh, behavior but there is one important detail that we would like to add to this uh, picture which is based on our uh, understanding or uh, the level of detail that we have learnt of these systems uh, and uh, what we have understood and built in our models we have seen uh, we drew e versus k relationships and we basically saw that based on where the brillouin zone is we saw a behavior that looks like this and we said that this is a band and this is another band okay uh, and let's assume that this is filled okay now uh, so in our discussion we simply pointed out that you know in a flat band structure this would then be the eg which is then corresponding to this value here eg okay so if you draw it to scale so that's where so this would be somewhere here then okay so so that it matches up correctly so that is the eg that you are looking at now the important thing to note here is that this is a diagram as i mentioned you know when you look at a three dimensional structure the brillouin zone has a certain shape to it and therefore exactly where the fermi surface touches it is going to differ based on the direction in which you look at the uh, the uh, brillouin zone and the fermi surface right so in some places it may touch the fermi surface uh, the brillouin zone uh, very quickly in some cases it may be little further away from the brillouin zone so these possibilities are there therefore the location of this uh, and and so it is important to understand that the location of the brillouin zone uh, boundary uh, or rather the brac plane in this case uh, is going to differ based on the direction right so uh, based on the direction that we uh, look at it the, this is going to differ so we can easily have a situation where i'm plotting now one direction in uh, one direction in uh, the uh, lattice uh, symmetry along this uh, side and a, a completely different direction along this i'm just say let's say this is the 110 uh, direction this is the 111 direction okay so so these are two different uh, directions in the lattice just for arbitrary description sake and we will just say that in one case uh, we see a behavior where uh, the brillouin zone looks like this or rather the uh, band structure looks like this okay so this is how it looks and uh, in another direction uh, we have a situation where uh, the uh, band structure looks something like this 
Okay. So, now what do we have here? We have a situation where uh, the uh, the location of the Brillouin on zones, I am just saying that it is a little further apart here. Okay. So, uh, so it is further apart here, these are much narrower, because they are much narrower, this band uh, ends faster here, it ends at, ends at a much lower energy level in this direction. Okay. So, the band ends in low, uh, is at a lower energy level in this direction, the next band starts at a uh, correspondingly uh, lower level uh, at in this, in this direction. Uh, relative to the uh, uh, end and start of bands on in this direction. Okay. So, now supposing the uh, Fermi energy level is here, I will just say this is E f. So, we have a situation where the uh, the valence band is defined by the uh, band structure in this uh, in this direction, I just say this is 1 1 uh, 0 direction let us say. right? and this is uh, uh, 1 1 1 direction. Okay, so, we will just put it this way, this is just arbitrarily we are just speaking two directions just to illustrate the point. Let us just say that in the 1 1 1 direction it looks like this, in the 1 1 0 direction it looks like this, just a schematic. So, now what we are saying is that uh, the uh, band structure uh, is like this in uh, the, uh, the, uh, in the in terms of the flat band depiction. Uh, it looks like this on the uh, side uh, where uh, on the in the 1 1 0 direction, uh, in the 1 1 1 direction we are actually seeing something else. So, the next available band here in the 1 1 uh, 0 direction is here, whereas the next available band empty location in, in another direction is actually lower in energy. Right? So, this is the this is again a filled band here. So, if you look at the uh, uh, in both cases may be the band gap may be the same, but uh, regardless we, if we just look at this level here, we find that the highest uh, occupied uh, um, level in the valence band is closer to the lowest unoccupied level in the conduction band in a different direction, okay, in a different location in, uh, in k space, in a different location in k space. Uh, the uh, so, the band gap rather than being defined by this is now defined by this. So, with less amount of energy you can take an electron from here and move it to here, because the band structure is different in different directions. This picture clearly to shows you that you can have anisotropy, why there is anisotropy in the material, because the E versus K relationship is the same, but where the uh, Brillouin zone boundaries appear is different for different directions. So, therefore, you can get a transition from here to a, uh, the next available level, uh, which is the closest in terms of energy. In terms of energy, it is uh, closest by going to a different direction, but uh, in terms of direction, it is a different direction. So, that is the thing. So, uh, the lowest available energy level is coming up uh, here uh, closer to this uh, highest level here relative to the uh, band that is showing up there. Okay. So, uh, so, you can have a transition that goes just this much distance and gets into a uh, available empty uh, energy level here that is permitted and therefore, this transition is allowed. Okay. So, the band gap tends to get defined by this distance rather than by that distance. When you have such a situation uh, uh, where the uh, lowest energy, uh, the highest energy uh, that is occupied in k space and the next available lowest energy in uh, that is vacant in k space, which are there in two different directions, then that is called an indirect band gap material. or in this case an indirect band gap semiconductor. So, this is an example of an indirect band gap semiconductor, where uh, 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 an electron uh, uh, the highest occupied uh, um, uh, energy level uh, is in one uh, direction in uh, k space or one location in k space and the lowest unoccupied uh, uh, the next lowest unoccupied uh, level is in uh, is at a different location in k space. Okay, so, these are two different locations, this is in this direction that is in the other direction, it is com completely different direction. So, so this is how we, uh, we have this. So, such a material is called an indirect band gap material, uh, whereas there are definitely other examples where uh, the uh, lowest uh, uh, occupied, uh, the lowest unoccupied state and the highest occupied state are both in the same direction in k space. Okay, so, where you do not have the situation, where you simply have only this part of the picture holding true and uh, that is fine. Okay. So, in that case you uh, the uh, the band gap is still defined by this original material. So, that would be a direct band gap semiconductor. Okay. So, from here to here 
if you go that is a direct band gap semiconductor the way we have drawn it here is an indirect band gap semiconductor i will just for clarity sake i'll just uh, add that here so that we can see that this is a so this is a direct band gap semiconductor okay uh, so we see fundamentally therefore that uh, we we see that there can be anisotropy we clearly see how anisotropy can exist and that these are two different situations what is the uh, result of it the result of it is simply this when you use a material for optical purposes uh, the uh, the material that uh, ultimately you have to provide the amount of energy corresponding to the band gap to uh, enable the transition however how easily the transition occurs also depends on where the uh, whether the uh, location of the transition is in exactly the same position or it has to go to some other location in the lattice side okay so therefore in general it is found that uh, indirect band gap semiconductors are less efficient in participating in optical processes than direct band gap semiconductors okay so direct band gap semiconductors are much more efficient in handling uh, optical processes than indirect band gap semiconductors so for example this is uh, silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor gallium arsenide is a uh, direct uh, band gap semiconductor gallium arsenide is a direct band gap uh, semiconductor this is an indirect band gap semiconductor so when you try to make a, a laser or things like that this is the kind of material that is preferred not this okay so we will wind up our discussion today where with basically these comments we have seen today uh, we have looked at semiconductors in detail we have looked at optical properties of materials uh, uh, and uh, and we have looked at both of these uh, from the perspective of uh, all the uh, things that we have learned so far the fermi energies the brillouin zones the bragg planes uh, and the band structures and we have recognized now that the e versus k relationship is a very important uh, uh, feature which gives us much more information about what the material will do than simply the flat band structure the flat band structure will not tell you whether something is a direct band gap semiconductor or an indirect band gap sem semiconductor so simply looking at the flat uh, flat band structure we cannot decide whether the material is useful for a particular purpose or not knowing the e versus k relationship you can say so because that will tell you uh, whether uh, the electron has to go to a different location to undergo the transition or it can undergo the transition at the same location if it has to go to a different location it has to have uh, energy to go up up as well as go to the different location so these are two different processes uh, here it simply has to have the energy to go up so the probability of this occurrence is much higher here than it is here and that is why this works better for optical purposes okay so with that we will conclude uh, this class uh, we will uh, take it up in the next class where we will look at other properties of materials thank you